Christians to children and families in Iraq. Kelly traveled to Iraq 27 times during that period. She and her companions lived in Baghdad throughout the 2003 shock and awe bombing. They have also lived alongside people during warfare in Gaza, Lebanon, Bosnia, and Nicaragua. Kelly has joined with activists in various regions of the U.S. to protest drone warfare by holding demonstrations outside of U.S. military bases in 2015 for carrying a loaf of bread and a letter across the line at Whiteman AFB. She served three months in prison. From April 9th to 16th, she was part of a seven-day fast across from the UN, urging that UN members use diplomatic tools to end the blockade of Yemeni ports and stop Saudi and US airstrikes. UN officials have called for a negotiated settlement of the conflict, noting that Yemen is on the brink of famine. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Ms. Kathy Kelly. Please give her a round of applause. Good evening to all of you, and I'm certainly grateful to be here. I was looking forward to the chance to come, uh, having been here before for one of the events that was sponsored by these groups. So a um, very special thanks to all of the people that Della has thanked, and um, I'm really feeling grateful for this opportunity um, to again connect with Jim and Shelley, and um, to, I feel sure, leave having uh, learned quite a bit just from the experience of again being in Birmingham, and coming down on the Greyhound bus, which is an experience wow. I, I certainly recommend. Uh, uh, I was thinking for Anthony, uh, we all have to start spending more time on buses and trains than on planes. So Anthony, this one was for you. Donna and Farouk very kindly said, well, what would you like to call this talk? And we thought of a few things and then settled down uh, courage for Peace, Not for War. And that was actually a banner that we had strung across the al Fanar Hotel in uh, Baghdad on Sharia Abu Nawas, a big, huge banner. And then accompanying it were enlarged photos of some of the most beautiful children you could ever meet. And we were a peace team in 2002 and three. We knew that at some point the United States was going to invade and. Um, attack Iraq with what was being billed as the shock and awe attack, and we had determined to stay there alongside people who had given us a great deal of hospitality in the past. Well, um, as it happened, um, on the day when um, we were pretty sure the Marines must be in some proximity to Baghdad, we didn't have electricity, we hadn't gotten any news reports, we certainly knew the shock and awe bombing was shocking and awful, and, 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 and Baghdad was um, hit morning, noon, and night with gut-wrenching explosions and sickening thuds, and uh, you could see mothers just in pure panic trying to reassure their children, putting on a poker face. And um, little Dima was, I suppose, um, for me, one of my favorites. She was eight years old, and she would sometimes be looking up at her father with a very apologetic look on her face because she had been so frightened, she had completely lost control of her own bladder, and she'd be standing in a pool of her own urine. And her father would be frustrated and angry that this has happened to his child, that she's so traumatized. And yet, of course, he is feeling tender for her. Well, it was also little Dima, who should not have been up on the roof of the Alphanar Hotel, but kids will be kids. And she had spotted, coming down along Sharia Abu Nawas, this big fancy street as things go in Baghdad. We were living in a family-owned hotel, but in a nicer section. And Jim had been there with us also during the, the bombing, and um, they in fact remember little Dima. Anyway, she came running down the staircase, screaming, Jamun! Askriya! Military! And well, and as it happened, that day, we had been told that looters, were also working their way systematically down Sharia Abu Nuwas. And I even feel a bit funny using that term, looters, because of course, people who've been without their most basic needs being met for year after year after year under the economic sanctions in Iraq, people who've just had the daylights pounded out of them, people who don't have any clue what tomorrow is going to bring, they decided to break into places where there were resources and take them. Well, we had resources. 
We had our American passports, our British passports, Australian passports. We had equipment. We had money. And so we realized that, you know, if the looters are really doing their homework, they're certainly not going to skip over the Alpha Now Hotel. And my heart was hammering. I was down at the front desk with Lou A, who was the hotel desk clerk, saying, look, Lou A, I, I, I know you have a gun in that desk, but don't pull it out. We all signed papers. If we're taken hostage, we'll go. We don't want to have any firefights here. And it was a really, really tense moment. So when little Dima came and announced, soldiers, and we all ran up to the second floor and looked as far as the eye could see, and there were Humvees, armored personnel carriers, bulldozers, <clears throat> jeeps, all beige vehicles moving slowly down the street. Well, life has its contradictions. I was one relieved pacifist. Now, please don't hear me saying I'm giving an excuse for the shock and awe bombing, because maybe the Marines saved us from what we couldn't predict. Not at all, because there were so many people whose lives have been forever destroyed by the shock and awe bombing, and there's been a consequence of successive invasions that lead to societal collapse. And at no point was that war ever warranted. I, I think that it's something that will remain always on the history of people in this country as, as a sting, as a terrible, shocking, and awful thing that happened. But I carry with me the image of that banner, Courage for Peace, Not for War. And Jim and I were fortunate to be befriended by a very wonderful Australian peace activist, Neville Watson. And Neville was a barrister, a <coughs> lawyer, and um, also had become a minister of the United Church of Christ. And it troubled Neville that some of us, when we saw the Marines and looked down and, you know, they. I said to Cynthia Bannis, well, they look awfully thirsty, don't they? And my friend Cynthia, she was about 65 years old at the time, said, I'm so glad you said that. Of course, that's the right thing to do. And Cynthia went over and grabbed two heavy six-packs of bottled water and trudged down to bring bottled water to the newly arrived Marines. And I sort of stood like a statue, not sure should I follow her. And um, we didn't have a consensus meeting on this. And then I remembered every Every Iraqi family had always said to us, us, come in, sit down, have tea, hold our children, sleep with us on the rooftop, even if they had nothing. They'd borrow from the neighbor so that we could have a bottle of Coke or Pepsi. And you'd be the only one, you know, in the blistering heat sitting there with your bottle of Pepsi. So I, I went and I, I remembered I had some dates under my bed and I, I got some bottled water and brought those out to the newly arrived Marines. It happened that um, the two that I walked toward were both um, from Indiana, and they were named Tom and Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> they said, that's right, man. You can call us Hoosiers. Do you want to see a picture of my wife and kids? And, and so it was a very, very surreal situation, but I looked up, and there was Neville, the barrister from Australia. He never abandoned his post, in a sense. He held a big cardboard sign that said, war equals terror, period. And uh, his knees were shaking. We had to beg him. Now, well, the sun has gone down. You can stop holding the sun. But we can't stop holding the sun. And so here we are now, faced with yet another war. And, and this one is uh, so shocking to me that I thought maybe I should offer you three stories, if you will, just to help explain why it is that I, I guess now wake up every morning and go to bed every night thinking about Yemen. Whereas two months ago, uh, I could spell Yemen, find it on the map, and we're about exhausting what Kathy Kelly knew about Yemen. So I want to start with a story about a youngster named Khaled Ahmed. He's actually an Afghan youngster. I had taught in Catholic high schools for 14 years, and I never expected that in my 60s, I'd be finding that my main mentors in life were a group of high schoolers, but <laughs> these Afghan kids are quite amazing. And uh, one thing I've taught them, I suppose, is that they can overcome their fear of donating blood. Uh, I go to <coughs> donate blood at the um, Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War every chance I can, usually at least two or three times a year in Kabul in Afghanistan, because I have O-negative blood, and they're always very glad to see me. It's kind of a that can be used all-purpose. 
And so uh, we were going to the hospital, about six of us, to see if we could donate blood. And uh, after I, my, I had donated the blood, I, I asked the Italian hospital workers whether it might be possible that the young man who had survived the Kunduz bombing was still in their hospital. Uh, because I knew there were several patients that had been uh, harmed, badly injured during that bombing. And they said, oh, Lord, yes, he's so lonely. Please, you and your friends, you visit with him. So I want to tell you a little bit about Khaled Ahmed's story. And welcome to those who just came in. We really just got started. I'm happy to tell you this. Can't hear you. Oh! Uh-oh. Can others hear me? Yes. Uh-oh. So loud. A little louder. Yeah. Okay, so forgive me if I'm blasting people out in the front because this is a high school study teacher's voice from hell, I've been told. <laughs> so Khaled Ahmed was a pharmacist working in the Kunduz province in northern Afghanistan. And he was toward the end of his internship. And his mother, on October 2nd, had remonstrated with him and said, no, Khaled, you cannot go to that hospital today. There's intense fighting. It's too dangerous. My son, your life means so much to me. Stay home. And he argued with her and said, but mom, they need me more than ever. Last week, we treated 359 patients. 50 of them were children. Do you mean you don't want me to go and they won't have enough people to work the pharmacy at this intense time? He said, besides, they promised us protection. If we need to be evacuated, they'll take us to the airport. And it is true. There was intense fighting going on between the Taliban fighters and the Afghan government military. And Kunduz is a major city in the north. That hospital was the only hospital in a, a wide stretch across northern Afghanistan. So Khaled Ahmed went to work. He and the chief pharmacist were told to go down and take their break and sleep for a few hours, and then they could come back up. But they were awakened at 2 o'clock in the morning by a huge explosion. And they ran upstairs, and they saw that the emergency room and the intensive care unit were both on fire. And patients that they had treated earlier that day were burning in their own beds. It was an utter nightmare. And they realized that this aerial terrorism must be coming, certainly not from the Taliban. The Taliban don't have fighter planes it was likely coming from the United States. And the bombing continued. The hospital authorities, who were part of Doctors Without Borders, sometimes called by Francois Francais, had already immediately notified the United States government, the United States military, NATO, and the UN, you're bombing a hospital. We submitted these coordinates to you before. This is a hospital. And this huge gunship, you can sort of imagine something almost the size of half of a football field, outfitted with cannons and with big, huge guns, firing incendiary devices at the hospital. And it went away and came back 15 minutes later, and came back again 15 minutes later. At 15-minute intervals, this United States gunship turned the hospital into rubble and ash. 42 people were killed, 12 of them were hospital staff, three were doctors. Khalid survived. He said that when he and the other pharmacists ran to find security to see if they could figure out what in the world was going on, the security people said, look, take your cell phones apart right away because the Americans have a technology and they can target you because of your cell phone. So take the battery out, take the SIM card out, and they quick did that, and then the security people said, all we can tell you is, run for it. And so first the chief pharmacist made a run, and he made it to the hospital gate and went, crossed outside of it, and then they said to Khaled Ahmed, okay, go. And Khaled said his heart was pounding, but he ran as fast as he could. He had one foot outside the gate, and then he caught shrapnel in his back. And he fell to the ground. He started to bleed profusely, and he began quickly to believe, because he was paralyzed on one side and he was losing consciousness, that he may be nearing death. And in Afghan tradition, if you know that you're going to die, then you try to reach your father if you can and say that you're sorry for anything you ever might have done to hurt your father 
or your family. But Khaled had taken his cell phone apart. And so he quickly, with one arm, tried to get the phone out of his backpack, put the battery back in, dial his home, and he reached his mother. And his mother was panicked, where are you, my son? And he said, Mom, I need to talk to Dad. And his mother wanted to know, where is he? Put Dad on the phone. And then talking with his father, Khaled Ahmed explained that he was hit with uh, some kind of a weapon. And the father had the presence of mind to say, tell me exactly where you are. And Khaled had rolled himself into a ditch right at the front entrance. And then the dad said, take your vest, put it under you. It will stop some of the bleeding. And so the father called relatives who lived nearby. They raced over to the Kunduz hospital, found Khaled, put him in a body bag. At that point, Khaled woke up briefly and said, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. And then he lost consciousness. There were no clinics that could serve him. He was too badly injured. So it was a hellish five-hour ride to the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War in Kabul, where Italian doctors run a hospital completely free of charge and completely neutral. They'll stitch up anybody. And they told me Khalid would survive, but he was greatly, greatly traumatized when I met him. He still had an internal catheter, an IV bag. He was, uh, he'd lost a great deal of weight. Uh, he needed assistance to walk. But mostly I think he was feeling some survivor's guilt. Why was his life spared? And when he found out I was from the United States, he asked me, why did your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. Why did your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. Three days later, a United States tank rolled into the bombed out entrance to the hospital, circled around, destroyed any possible evidence it would seem, and um, until about three months ago, there was no report on what had happened. The United States military then did produce a report, and when I read about it in the Chicago Tribune, there was a very telling line. There was an acknowledgment that this was a disproportionate attack against a non-existent threat. And truthfully, I think that describes much of the war making the United States has done. A disproportionate attack against a non-existent threat. The Doctors Without Borders have said they want an independent investigation. But instead, something that's a terrible, tragic irony happened. Doctors Without Borders have four hospitals in Yemen. And on October 25th, one of their main hospitals in Yemen was attacked by the Saudi coalition, a coalition of nine countries working with Saudi Arabia and attacking indiscriminately civilian targets all across Yemen. And so this hospital was bombed. And Ban Ki-moon said to the Saudi generals, you can't attack hospitals. And the chief general, uh, Brigadier General Azeri, said, well, sometimes the United States makes a mistake, you know. And we'll ask the United States to guide us about targeting more effectively. Now, four Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders hospitals, have been targeted in Yemen. In military parlance, when you hit a target with uh, a, a weaponized drone, or with the assistance of a drone surveillance vehicle, if somebody is, survives the hit and starts to run, that person is called a squirter. Amy Goodman was interviewing me on Democracy Now! And Amy's about heard it all and seen it all, you would think. She's a very wonderful reporter. And she looked at me and she said, a, a squirter? And I said, yes, Amy, a squirter. I would never want Khaled Ahmed to know that in military parlance, when he ran, he was considered a squirter. A second story. I haven't had a television since I was 17. Those of you who are closer to my generation, I, I thought Farrah Fawcett was a plumbing company. I never knew anything about television. But um, 
uh, I think one effect of that is that sometimes when I see something televised, I, I perhaps react a little disproportionately in a way. So I was in New York and invited to give a talk at Manhattan College and then over at the Mary House Catholic Worker. And, and I thought, well, I should watch President Trump's speech before both houses of Congress because that's very current and I should, you know, bite the bullet. And I was staying in an apartment that had a television, so I watched the speech. It flattened me. The next day, I, I barely could move. Why was that? Well, in that speech, you may have read about it or seen it. One of the moments, and this is typical of presidents addressing galleries full of elected officials, they had in the audience somebody whose story would galvanize the public and all the people viewing. And in this case, it was the bereaved widow of Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen, a Navy SEAL. And she was struggling hard to keep her composure. And she was looking upward, and President Trump was telling her, you know he's up there. You know he's, he loves you. Or, uh, I might know that, but it's something to that effect. And he um, told her that her husband's story would never, ever be forgotten, and that his heroism would always be remembered. But something very curious is that at no point, even as everybody in the both houses of Congress gathering was standing and applauding for four minutes, at no point did anyone covering this story or President Trump mention where Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen was killed. Where did it happen? And I think that when we learn more about the context, then it's not so surprising that it wasn't mentioned. You see, there was a, a night raid. The United States in Yemen wanted to attack Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula. And one way to launch these attacks is to try to catch people by surprise. And so they had come by helicopter, and some of the most highly trained warriors in the world, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Green Berets, come pouring out of the aerial vehicles and their own Humvees. And the idea is to burst into a home and surprise people. Well, there was quite a ruckus, and some of the neighbors thought this was a rival tribe that had burst into the home of their neighbor. And so they started running from all different directions, and there was a, a huge battle that began. And in the course of that battle, Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen was killed. And arms of his family will ache for a loved one who will never return. We must not diminish that. <coughs> That same night, as the battle is going on, the United States had called in more air support. And a young single mother named Sala, with her two children, was huddled in the darkness, and missiles tore through her home. And she wanted to save her children. She didn't quite know what to do. And so she decided to bundle up her children and run. And she just had made it out the door when she was attacked and killed. With both her children the infant and her uh, toddler son did survive. That night, there were 16 civilians killed. Uh, 10 of them were children under 13 years of age. Six were women. And so this was never mentioned by the media in covering what happened in al Riyal in Yemen the night that one American military person was killed. There was no mention that Yemen is a country that's on the brink of famine. And it's a conflict-driven famine. That while that country has become a, a, a place where people cannot find food or water or medicine, and they're now facing an outbreak of at least 185 cases of cholera, with 45% of their health care facilities functioning, with uh, 70 hospitals all told, having been killed by players in different sides to this terrible civil war that's been raging. But we have to acknowledge that the United States, since July of 2015, has sent to the Saudi military tens of billions of dollars worth of weaponry. 
Patriot missile systems, combat ships, uh, uh, the capacity to enact a naval blockade so that the Yemenis can't get food in. They're starving and they can't get food. The five cranes at the major port have all been destroyed by Saudi coalition bombing. And so this means that the situation, which was already drastic, has become far, far worse. And once again, where is the story of people in Yemen in our media? And I, in a sense, feel like I almost have to allow myself to face up to the terrible metaphor with Sala, the young mother who was killed, running from the projectiles that had torn open her home, trying to save her children, would she and the children be called scorchers? And I believe that we will never ever find security if we view other human beings as scorchers as objects. Well, we, the United States, are the exceptional ones. And if we make the attack, then it must be done in the name of freedom and democracy and bringing something better to the world. I think our security will always be founded far more wisely, far more rationally, in extending the hand of friendship, in deliberately sharing our resources, in trying to live more simply so that we can stop being the people who believe we suddenly have an automatic right to commandeer so much of the world's wealth and resources while mothers literally weep. Or in the case in Afghanistan, again and again I've experienced it. Mothers come and say, I think I'm losing my mind. I feel that I'm going insane. I believe I'm becoming emotionally disturbed. What's wrong, Anima? Sanguna say more. Shadika, why are you saying this is always the same? Because I cannot feed my children. I'm so fortunate in Chicago to work with Meta Sabia Rigby. She's from Ethiopia. And she herself uh, was in an Ethiopian orphanage, has experienced being a refugee, and um, she then grew up as, as the adopted daughter of people who worked for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So she's seen plenty of um, experiences with refugees. And we were doing just a little bit of research, and I, we both said, no, that can't be. We thought that somehow uh, the United Nations must have gotten their facts wrong. But we checked it out. In 2016, the United States took in 89,880 refugees. Yemen, the country I've been describing, took in 117,000 refugees. And already, 225,000 Somalis were already living in Yemen, having sought refuge. There's a whole trio of conflict-driven, near-famine conditions in Nigeria, in <coughs> South Sudan, in Somalia. And some people, in desperation, will get on a boat and go to another shore, thinking they might find help. There are people who walk for miles. And uh, when they finally thought they were going to land in a town where there might be food, and blankets and some kind of humanitarian aid, dis they discovered there was nothing. And the reporter, Ina Craig, writing about it, said she witnessed people eating the trees. They were so desperately hungry. It's possible that as many as 20 million people won't survive these near famine conditions if it tips into famine. One United Nations official um, he's it, 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 just a, recently appointed to the World Food Program, has just about been begging President Trump, pay attention to this. And he was appointed by Trump. He's kind of a Trump supporter, really. But he sees the wider picture. Uh, somebody from the Norwegian Refugee Council, Jan Eaglin, just said last week, I was shocked to my bones. Shocked to my bones. But we'll be seeing the pictures of little children who are barely flesh and bones, with the large eyes and the wizened faces and their hair falling out, if action isn't taken. So the Saudi government, knowing that President Trump will soon be visiting, has wanted to create a sort of a, a, a stronger friendship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Now, 
the Saudis are offering to invest $40 billion in infrastructure in the United States. But I think about their starving neighbors on that same peninsula, and it makes me wish that you know we could come up with other ways to generate income, maybe not give so much to Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Raytheon and other military contractors who've already become overwhelmingly wealthy by selling weapons to so many places. Maybe we could find other ways to solve our problems and the Saudis could extend that hand of friendship to people in Yemen. And President Trump has decided that even though under President Obama, after all of the military sales that were up on the screen before, um, after all those sales were conducted in 2015, President Obama then said, look, we're going to stop on providing any more wet weapons, even through sales, because the human rights situation and the indiscriminate bombing is too bleak. And the United Nations was saying they're, they're bombing roadways and tra public transportation, including buses and public gatherings, including weddings and hospitals and mosques and schools, and this can't go on. The President Trump has said, oh, well, we'll um, rescind President Obama's ruling, and now we are ready to send possibly as much as $100 billion worth of weaponry to Saudi Arabia. That would include the FAD uh, anti-nuclear weapon system. Uh, it would include uh, the um, surface-to-air missiles and other bombs, all of which have already been used in Yemen, and also bunker busters, this new invention that burrows down into the ground and then from underground explodes. I'd like to think it's not too much to hope that a country like Saudi Arabia could change, could recognize the extraordinary opportunity that it has to say that they aren't any longer going to try to control the lives of others by using threat and force and bloodshed and weapons. I'd like to think the United States could set an extraordinary example and say that particularly at this time of global warming, we can't afford to continue to throw our resources into building up more and more weapon systems that could push the world into a nuclear disaster as well. But I think that the momentum for that has to come from us, from ordinary people like ourselves. And one of the great gifts of my life has been the chance to watch these young kids in Afghanistan. I mean, they have electricity every other day, maybe. They all grew up experiencing hunger. Some of them would spend from 2 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock in the morning going out on a donkey to a remote mountainside to wrestle with a pickaxe, tumbleweed, and uh, different kinds of sources for um, fuel out of the mountainside, pack that into their burlap bags another six hours down the mountain. I mean, this is their situation. They have no possibility of employment in their futures, even though they study hard and they've tried to learn other languages. And they've, they've just been an exemplary, wonderful group of youngsters. And I've watched them, from their situation, take very dramatic steps to try to make a better world. So I'd just like to offer one story that stays with me quite a bit. Um, sometimes stories don't come out until the middle of the night, and sometimes under circumstances that aren't the best. But I'm very close to a particular family, and there have been some violence that I witnessed. Uh, one of the brothers hit one of the sisters, and I was angry. Uh, if it had been the United States, I would have said, you're coming home with me, you know. But it's a different situation. So late at night, one of the other brothers, wanting me to understand, said, Kathy, let me tell you a story. <coughs> there was a night in the Bamiyan province when we, all of us, would be so cold. We each only had a thin blanket, and our mother couldn't give us more. And my brother, my oldest brother, was sound asleep. And my second oldest brother was shivering with the cold, and he thought, if I just take Khaled's blanket and take it long enough to warm myself up, I'll give it back to him, and I can go back to sleep. But the oldest brother woke up, and he knew if he didn't get his blanket back, he might die of hypothermia, 
And so there developed a rage-filled fight over the blanket. These two brothers struggled, one almost suffocated the other. The family woke up, everybody was alarmed. They were trying to pull the brothers apart. It's a hard memory. But they wanted me to understand some of what their situation has been in the past. Now those two brothers and that family have been right at the ground floor and like shepherds maintaining a project called the Duvet Project. Um, the story I told you came from their past. But they've been part of making sure every cold winter in Kabul that they're outside pulling apart the wool, giving portions of wool to widows and mothers who can't feed their children, making sure they have the coverlets, making sure it's all organized and accounted for. And then those women make the heavy blankets. And this is after my young friends have been like young social workers going up the mountainside trying to figure out where are the neediest families, who are the mothers who can't feed their children, going to the refugee camps, going into really desperate situations. Anyway, the duvets are then made, and then my friends go with, a, they call it a lorry, and they collect them all, and those are distributed to the poorest families free of charge. And these youngsters repeatedly tell us, we want to live without war. We want to abolish war. We don't understand how people in your country could ever think that by sending your young people over here, they're going to be able to solve problems of terrorism. And of course, these youngsters have lived under terrible aerial terrorism. So I'm very, very fortunate to have these associates. Um, Abdul Hai likes to run. He wants to be a handsome teenager in very trim and fit shape, like teenagers all around the world, I'm sure. And I don't like it when he runs, because the, some of the worst air on this planet is in Kabul. And uh, the fecal matter in the air and the, the pollutants, it's just awful. And he shouldn't be out running in that. But anyway, he came back from running, and he said, look, I'll tell you a story you like to hear. And he was running in... Um, he ran past a woman sitting cross-legged in her steel burqa, and her arm was outstretched. And he realized that the woman was Habib's grandmother. And Habib is a youngster who, um, to earn some money for his mother, his grandmother, and his little brother, they live under a plastic tarp with poles. They don't even have a mud hut. He would go out with a scale, and he'd, he'd put it down, and people could stand on the scale and weigh themselves, and then give him a little bit of money. And that's how Habib would try to earn money for his family. And, and then he disappeared for a while. We don't know what happened to him, but then he came back. And uh, we wondered if maybe he hadn't tried to join a fighting group to make some money, but then he's not going to do that again. And so there was the grandmother out trying to earn the money. Now, if I had been Abdul Hai, I can imagine I might have kept on running. I can imagine I might have thought, what can I say? You know, what can I do? But he didn't. He stopped. He greeted her. Assalamu alaikum. Chitarasi. And he told her how proud they all were of Habib because he's now <coughs> part of the speaking school. He wished her well. She wished him well. She called him Pisadam, my son. And then he continued on. And I like that story because I think that's part of the answer. To try our very, very best to see the person under the burqa. You, know, you can't see that face, it's hidden, but to know there is a person. To see the persons that are trapped in the war zones who never met us any harm. To become literate, literate in the stories of those who bear the brunt of war. Mm -hmm. And then to entrust, entrust those people to our communities in our prayer life and in our desire to join them to build a better world. Very kindly, Farouk and Gala and uh, Jim and Shelley and others have invited uh, NX Khan to come here. Um, I've spent <laughs> time in prison, one year in maximum, for planting corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites, and uh, three months more recently for trying to deliver a loaf of bread to the commander at a military base in Whiteman Air Force Base in uh, uh, Missouri. And um, I'm older now, my voice isn't very strong, but I'd like to end my part of this presentation by just offering a song that has stayed with me very, very much 
the women let me join the gospel choir, which was a great way to make the time go by at Lexington Prison, and I, uh, they, they just had wonderful voices. So I'll just offer this song. As an army rising up, there's an army rising up to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains falling. I hear those chains. Unchain ourselves from war as kindred spirits together and as fast as we can. Thank you very much.